so I've put on the blackboard two famous quotes, not the most famous quotes, but two, of the most, two famous quotes from Thomas Hobbes. And the reason I put these on blackboard is there's going to be a stark contrast between what Hobbes is doing with ethics and what we've been looking at so far. Although you will recognize um, some people's ideas, like Thrasymachus. You'll see Thrasymachus kind of reflected in Hobbes. And so think back to Plato and the Republic, <coughs> uh, the very first discussions that we were engaged in. This is one of the things that he says. He talks about a general inclination of all mankind, you know, humankind, according to a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only with death. If there is something that he thinks is most basic to the human condition, that's it. So this is Hobbes' view of human nature. This is what we call his anthropology, his view of, of what it is to be a human being. Um, a lot of the things that we think of as moral concepts, Hobbes is going to revalue. He's going to look at it in a very different way. And you may find this attractive, um, or you may find it repugnant, or you may find it um, irritating, or you may find it, bless you, as somebody like myself does, to be in some ways very insightful and in some ways very wrong. Um, I, I myself have done a lot of writing on Thomas Hobbes. I've published quite a few pieces and done a lot of conference presentations on Hobbes. And it's not because I agree with Thomas Hobbes. It's not because I think this is actually true. It's because I think this is this reflects, to some degree, what human nature can become when things go wrong. And we'll talk about that a bit more next class session when we talk about the state of nature and the, the Leviathan and the social contract. Um, another quote that you might have heard is that um, life outside of authority or you know society is nasty, brutish, and short. Did any of you ever hear that phrase, nasty, brutish, and short? That's coming from Hobbes, too. That's coming from what we're going to look at next class. Um, this is how we get there. This is, if this is true, that what really motivates us is seeking power after power after power, that's how we can get to life being nasty, brutish, and short if we don't have some sort of contractarian thing to keep us in check. Here's the other one. This is even more radical. Whatsoever is the object of any man's or woman's, right? Hobbes is not gender specific in that way. Appetite or desire, <clears throat> that is it which he for his part calls good. There being nothing simply and absolutely so, nor any common rule of good and evil. Now if that's true, we're in trouble. Um, and we'll look at why he thinks that's the case. This is a very radical challenge to all the ethics that we've been studying so far. And it's a very radical challenge to the ethics that we're going to study after Hobbes. Uh, that doesn't mean that Hobbes is actually right. It just means that you know, if you want to pick somebody to be you know, the toughest villain possible, um, some people would say that, that Friedrich Nietzsche would be the person to do. I would say it's Thomas Hobbes. That's why we're going to look at him for at least a couple of class sessions, because he's posing such a interesting <laughs> and deep challenge to notions that we normally work with of right and wrong. And the reason why I had you do this, writing down as many moral concepts as you can think of, is I'm going to put these on the board, and um, we'll see you know, where the class is, and then we'll actually talk about which ones Hobbes revalues, which one Hobbes is going to change from what you've been studying so far, and what you may feel in your hearts, what you may have been brought up with, what you may have thought up until this point. I'm, I'm not actually hoping that any of you leave the classroom uh, committed Hobbesians. That might actually be a bad thing <laughs> in some ways. Uh, but I would like you to at least sense the depth of the, the challenge that's going on here. So, um, let's see. Egoism. Okay. A moral theory. Maybe I'll have one thing for moral theories. Um, and I'll put divine law and natural law over here as well. And they also had highest good, it's a concept. And 
happiness. And those are the little concepts we've thought about. Reason, very good. Um, practical reasoning, I'll leave that under reason. Morals is, is uh, kind of broad. Oh, somebody put some of the virtues. Um, moderation. Uh, patience. Justice, liberality, very good. Um, utilitarianism, somebody's been reading ahead, which is good. Always happy that, that people are. <coughs> uh, oh, good. Stoicism, um, relativism. space pretty quickly. Um, as well often happens in this class, I'm pleasantly surprised by how much <coughs> you guys as Maris students uh, work on this. Law, um, put that over here. Law in general, religion, um, final ends, very nice. Another virtue over here, kindness. Um, some people have, oh, well, some people put uh, people on here. That wouldn't be quite the same as concepts, but that's good. But they also put the analogy of the cave, and I guess you could call that a moral concept. Right? So actually, it's like a bunch of moral concepts put together. That's very good. Um, pleasures. Desires. Uh, rationality. Appetite. Um, Start to run out of room. portion of the board. And this is after asking you just for a minute to write stuff down. So actually you should feel pretty proud of yourself as a class. Um, this is the stuff that, you know, ethics is, is made of. These are the concepts. This is the vocabulary. And you guys have been acquiring it. Some, some were able to recall more. I think if I sat you down all for, you know, these five, ten minutes, most likely most of you would come up with a list this long. Right, as, as one thing led to thinking about another thing. Now that's good. That's the way that we think about ethics. Um, and you know that with these things, not everybody sees things the same way. Like let's say we take the highest good. Um, if somebody is what we call a hedonist, what do they think the highest good is? Does anyone know? Okay. They're a hedonist. Yeah. This is something that we touched on a little bit. Yeah. Pleasure. Pleasure, very good. It comes from the Greek word for pleasure. And, um, you know, we saw some reflections of this attitude. We didn't see anyone, like, espousing it uh, straight out, but we saw Aristotle talking about this, a hedonistic lifestyle. He said, yeah, we like pleasure, but that's not the best thing that we can have. So a hedonist thinks that the highest good is pleasure. Um, what does Aristotle think the highest good is? Anyone remember offhand? It was kind of complicated, right? A couple things all together. What's the core of it, though? I'll give you a hint. It's one of the things that's up here. Yeah. Moderation. That would be one part of that. Moderation is a virtue. Virtue. Very good. Um, what if you're a Thrasymachus? What do you think the highest end or the highest good is? Power. Power. Very good. 
Thomas Hobbes is saying there is no such thing. There is no highest end. Period. If there's only higher ends for different people, and that changes from time to time. There is nothing in the nature of things that you know produces a highest end for us. All we have are things that we pursue along the way. Um, and you know, because human beings are more or less similar to each other, we can make some generalizations. But your highest end may not be the same thing as her highest end. And as a matter of fact, your highest end right now may be very different than your highest end um, two hours from now. Or, you know, 20 years from now or something like that. Um, these are all theories. Hobbes, Hobbes is not going to talk about theories so much, but he is going to talk about all these different moral concepts. And so he's going to talk about happiness in a very different way than Aristotle or Thomas or, or Plato did. Um, we're not reading the, the areas where he talks about religion, but Hobbes is actually a very skeptical guy when it comes to religion. He thinks that religion originally has its origin in, in human beings' fears of the unknown, and he's got a whole sort of theory about how this gets you know, blown up into big organized religions. Um, that's in one of the other chapters if you want to read it. Um, he looks at honor in a very different way than Plato or Aristotle does. Sin, Hobbes um, does not worry so much about that. He says, well, you first you have to have a lawgiver, and then you can worry about sin. Um, you're going to see that he looks at reason and virtue and vice in very different ways. If you really think that there is no rule, for good and evil, that it's just sort of whatever people happen to come up with in this place or that place, what do you think happens to the ideas of virtues and vices? Remember, virtue is some sort of good habit that produces good effects consistently, a vice is something that's a bad habit that produces bad things consistently, but if the whole notion of good and, and bad is up for grabs, what happens to that? We might not even have the same categories of virtue and vice as somebody else. Think about, you know, more violent societies than our own. Think about Afghanistan, for example. Um, nobody's successfully held Afghanistan, including Afghans. There's never been a, a long-term successful government of Afghanistan. And people fight each other for all sorts of reasons there, with you know, bloody ways. Um, what might be a virtue there? What, what do you think they look up to, a lot of people? Being a really tough guy. Being willing to kill people, you know, uh, when you need to, very quickly, very efficiently. Is that something you guys prize? Anybody here, you know, loves almost psychopathic killers? thinks that's the best thing that you could be in our society. We do, we do have some segments of our society where that's the case, right? Uh, criminal underworld, prisons, some prisons. The California prison system. If you got put into the California prison system, which is run by gangs, and you wanted to survive, you probably should actually be as violent and, and crazy as possible. Because that's probably the only way to make it through. Um, if you're in the Indiana prison system, you can make it through without joining a gang because it's better. It's better run. A lot of this, you know, varies from circumstance to circumstance. Hobbes is on to something. If you don't actually have a strong, well-rooted sense of right and wrong, where are you going to get all these ideas from, and how are you going to? I think all of you know people who use this kind of language, but they don't live up to it. Yeah? Do you? You know people who talk about, you know, doing the rational thing and you watch them and they're pretty irrational. Or they're only they're only rational when it serves their interests. And then when it comes to like, you know, doing the right thing for you or for somebody else that you think is important. Um, suddenly, you know, th this is an exception to the rule and it doesn't count or they've got some sort of... Have you run into this sort of thing before? 
You ever been victim to it? Yeah. Um, we're, you know, we're susceptible to incredible variance with these things. And if you don't have these sort of concepts pretty well rooted in your psyche, you may end up looking like the Hobbesian kind of individual. Remember when Aristotle talked about the, the person who lacked self-control? They kind of look a little bit like, like Hobbes' ideas. They, they have, you know, just conflicted desires. They want to do what they think is the right thing, but it's really not that compelling for them because they don't do the right thing. They do something else instead. Maybe because of pleasure masters them, or anger masters them. So Hobbes is going to put all of these things through a, uh, a ringer, and they're going to come out looking very different in the end. So let's, let's actually take a look at what he, what he does. I'm going to erase these quotes, too. Um, say are the most basic concepts in ethics? If you had to pick just a few. Well, it's Oh, that's a good question. So most, most basic as in most important or most simple. Maybe like the ones that we could we could say we, we need to use all the time in order to do that things. Um, what are we ultimately trying to do when we're, when we're thinking about ethics? We're trying to say something about something. Yeah. Yeah, I think th those are probably the most basic notions: good or bad, or right or wrong. Right. Um, how do we know what's what's actually good and bad? Remember at the beginning of the semester we did that sort of tablet of you know what are things you think are good, what are things you think are bad, um, you put pleasure on one side, pain on the other, family. Well, family could straddle both sides. If you have a bad family, that's say it uses you, but most of you I think didn't, didn't uh, have that, which is why you're here, successful human beings, right? Um, so yeah, good and bad. Good, good and bad are good and evil, or right and wrong. These seem to be the most basic concepts. Hobbes doesn't start out with these. Hobbes is going to move towards these. For Hobbes, the most basic idea is that um, everything is material. And so, he, you know, he, he's got some kind of strange ideas. If you, if you ask Hobbes about God, you know, because he, he, say, he says that he believes in God. And actually, this is, this is the Leviathan, the whole... Thing, and what you're reading are just little slivers of it. The second half of the book is all devoted to theology. So how to believe in some sort of God, but you know, how do you get God in the picture if you're a complete materialist? You think everything is just what we can touch, see, feel, matter, right? Even mind, if you're a materialist, what do you think your mind is? It's your brain. So take your brain out, you know, do some of these science fiction things. Um, we we uh, take Mr. Schwartz's brain out, and we put Mr. Cohen's brain into Mr. Schwartz's skull, and you know, forget all the you know tricky stuff that would be involved in that, and we, we swap uh, Mr. Schwartz's brain into Mr. Cohen's skull, and now you know we'd have to call him Mr. Cohen and then Mr. Schwartz because his personality, who he is, would be in, in this body, and your personality would be in that body. Right? That's those are sort of implications of, of materialism. There's no soul, there's no spirit, or anything like that. Um, now, if you're a materialist, what do you actually have to work with? You've got matter. Like, here's one kind of matter, and here's another kind of matter put together in different ways. And what can matter take on? It can take on different shapes, different configurations. Like, this is plastic, you know. Plastic is, is pretty complicated. You know where this comes from, ultimately, for the most part? Oil. Bless you. When we're, when we're thinking about fossil fuels, some of it we burn, some of it goes into making plastics. You can make plastics out of other things too, like corn. But most of it's made out of oil. And these are really complex molecules. You guys remember chemistry class, right? You know, simple things like chalk, 
or salt. Remember what salt was? Sodium chloride, sodium the atom, uh, chloride, <coughs> chlorine the atom. Um, okay, it gets more complicated when you've got, this is some sort of bicarbonate or something like that. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it is. And then you've got organic things like, like plastic. Then you've got the stuff that you're made of, even more complicated. But it's really just matter put together in different ways. And think about your body now. Your body is really complicated, isn't it? It doesn't look that complicated from the outside. And if you're not, if you don't really know what you're doing and you open it up, it doesn't look that complicated on the inside either, does it? You know, like if you, if you accidentally cut yourself, have any of you ever had a bad cut where you can actually see like what's underneath? It kind of grosses you out if you look at it. Some people it does, some people it doesn't. Um, but what if you looked at it under a microscope? Do you remember back in biology class in high school? When, did you guys have like freshman year or sophomore year? When did you guys have biology? Maybe you had it in eighth grade, I don't know. When, when did you have it? Freshman year? Freshman year? Yeah. I'm, I'm so far removed from that, um, time-wise. What was your body composed of? Remember, like, did you do that thing where you take a little drop of blood and you put it on the slide and look at it? What did you guys look at in biology class? What did you do? It's not that long ago. <laughs> do you remember anything from, or are you just trying to get through it? Did you dissect uh, frogs or pigs or cats or something like that? Um, well, what's the human body composed of? You, you don't have to remember biology class and all this. This is basic knowledge. What are you made of? I asked my, my son this once, and he said, we're made of blood. <laughs> and then I would go around for a while and say, Daddy, I'm made of blood. You're made of blood. You know, and it's kind of, after a while, it gets a little creepy. You know? <laughs> but that's, you know, a three-year-old, right? Um, they're learning about the world. And yeah, there's a lot of blood in you, and there's bones, and nerves and meat and, and all that sort of stuff, but what are they made of? What is all that made of? It's a complex organization of cells. Cells, right. And each one of those cells, when you looked at it under a microscope, um, was it simple? No. It's, it's made up of a whole bunch of other things, and if they're not put together, together in the right way, what happens? Let's say, for instance, you know, um, they, you know, the way things turn out, your heart's over here, instead of being up here. Is that going to work? They, I'm, I don't know. Maybe it could. I'm not a scientist, but probably not. Um, or if your heart's too big or too small, or if it's only got three ventricles instead of four ventricles, or if the veins are going the wrong ways, or what happens when the veins get blocked? So, somebody, a stroke. You get a stroke, and then uh, either you're going to live, or you're going to die. And that's the way organisms are. Think about your body. Um, you have, like you said, a complex set of systems all connected to each other. You've got a circulatory system down in these tiny capillaries and all the blood's flowing in these different ways. You have a gastrointest gastrointestinal <coughs> system. You have, uh, so you can consume food and actually get something out of it. Um, you have nerves going into all these different parts of your body. Um, you have a skeleton. And all those things are material, right? That's why scientists can know something about them. We can do these amazing things with medicine. Um, so you've got structure, you've got matter. And then what else about matter is important? Well, it moves. If your blood stops moving, what's going to happen to you? It will stop moving at one point for, for each one of you, unless you're vaporized. What's going to be? What, when will that be? When you're dead. If your blood stops moving. That, that's it. What happens if your nerves stop transmitting electrical impulses? You're, you're dead. That's it. 
You know, your, your nerves are constantly transmitting electrical impulses. If, if they didn't, you wouldn't breathe. And your heart wouldn't beat. And nothing else would take place. So all of that has to be going on. As a matter of fact, even like, you know, your GI tract has to be constantly doing stuff or else you're going to die. To stop is death for a physical organism. It's not just sharks, you know, it's a shark stops swimming and dies. I don't know if that's actually true or not. Does anybody know if that's actually true? Here? Okay. Um, something about the water going over its gills. But for a human being, for Hobbes, what's most basic is motion. And he thinks that the way that we're put together, we have all these different motions going on all the time, and we're not all that aware of what's going on inside of ourselves. None of you, like, got up this morning and said, all right, now i got to start breathing. I uh, haven't been breathing enough. Or I was breathing enough for sleeping, but now i got to make myself take more breaths, right? Or when you start running, do you, do you say to yourself, all right, now lungs, breathe more. You, you don't do that, right? Most of this is unconscious. It's happening below the level of your awareness. Hobbes thinks that's the case with the things that you desire and the things that you turn away from as well. That most of the things that we feel towards one thing or another are that way. And he talks about motion as, as um, uh, something he calls endeavor. Now, endeavor means, you know, trying to strive, trying to get towards something. But he talks about three basic uh, conditions. One is what he calls appetite. And where did we see this term before? Remember Plato? Appetites? What do you have appetites for? Besides food? As a human being? All of us have the same basic appetites. What else do you want to do? I'll give you a hint. If you don't do them, some of them you'll die. Eat and drink, because you're not like one of those mouses that can, mice that can get enough uh, water from its food. What else do you want to do? Your, what does your body want to do? Sleep. Yeah, if you don't sleep after a while, you go insane. And your body will break down. And then what's the what's the other big one? Have sex. Yeah. I mean, now that you've passed the age of puberty, before you reach the age of puberty, it was basically I want candy, and then afterwards. Other things. Um, now, is everything that you, are all the motions that you have sort of the motions of your heart, your, your soul, are they all towards things? No, there's some that are away from things. If I shine a bright light in your eyes, do you like that? What do you naturally try to do? What does your body try to, try to do? Look away, yeah. Um, what if I just keep poking you? Standing behind you in line, uh, you, you hit me. <laughs> why would you? Why would you do that? Because you don't like being poked, right? I don't think any of us like like somebody poking at you. Imagine I'm, I'm behind you in the line at the cafeteria, and while I'm, I'm waiting in line, I just figure I'll just give you a couple pokes. You wouldn't like that. <coughs> uh, what are some other things you don't like that you're averse to? That you actually like bodily turn away from? Are there noises you, you don't like? Yeah. Like the fire alarm when it goes off in your dorm at 3 in the morning, and then you got to go outside because some, some you know, jerk pulled it because uh, they were drunk. And then you go outside, and the weather's like this, and now what do you feel like besides man? Man is a complex emotion. Um, what do you feel like bodily? Cold. Yeah, and what does cold feel like? You don't want to be there, right? You naturally kind of turn away from it. What if, what if you're, what if it's the opposite? What if it's too hot? That's where my goldie rocks. Your body wants to get away from that too, right? It feels pain. So we have appetite and aversion. And um, there's something else that's possible too. And that's what Hobbes calls contempt. And he's using the word in a little bit different way than we normally do. 
What contempt means is um, not feeling uh, appetite or aversion towards it, just not caring about it at all. And it's not just because you don't care about it at all, it's because you actually feel an appetite and aversion towards other things. You're feeling these all the time. But you may not, for instance, care about my coffee. I, do any of you care about my coffee? I doubt it, right? Because it's my coffee and it's really no concern of yours. Um, now, if you wanted my coffee and you, you know, were willing to battle me for it, then you are feeling appetite for it. If I force my coffee on you and I say, take this, drink it, and you say, I don't want to do that, you're feeling aversion, right? Like, think about when you were a kid. I don't know if this, this happened to you, but if you had a dad who drank beer, you probably, or maybe your mom did, I don't know, or your uncle, they would have you go to the refrigerator and get beer for them, because adults are kind of lazy. <laughs> um, you, you ever, like, open it and take a sip when you're a little kid? You don't try it again after that, do you? Because it tastes awful, because your taste buds are not are not acclimated to it. You don't enjoy the taste and you wonder, God, what's wrong with adults? How can they drink this crap, you know? Uh, but then when you get to be about, you know, 18, 19 years old, of course 21 here because of the laws, um, and no, none of you are breaking the laws, um, you, your taste buds actually change. Your physical taste buds modify and bitter things start to become good tasting to you. And things that you didn't like before, you, you start trying again and you find you like them. This fits into what Hobbes is talking about. Things that you were averse to before you now find enjoyable. And Hobbes breaks this down further. When the object that you feel appetite for is um, absent, we call that desire. And when the object is present, we call it love. So Hobbes would say, when you're eating that chocolate bar, you love that chocolate. You are feeling love towards that. Um, when the object is, is not present, then you use this term aversion towards it. You're averse to, um, let's take beer for example. Have any of you ever tasted um, some really bitter, dark, stout beer and you don't like it? I like it myself. Um, but I remember it was kind of interesting, right? I like to drink Guinness Extra Stout. Okay. And I had this Liberian. <laughs> See, some of you feel aversion towards it. And I just have to mention it. It's not present. And yet you can be like, oh, I don't want that. Um, apparently in Liberia, they make young men drink it to like, you know, prove their manhood because they, they don't like the taste of it. Um, they make it do a lot of other crazy things, too. When the object is present, what do you feel that? Hate. So, uh, you can do this with people, too. You know, there's some people that rub you the wrong way. If they're not around, you're averse to them. If they're around, you hate them. Now, this is, very, this is a very different use of love and hate than what we're used to. <coughs> Hobbes was saying this is basic human psychology. Um, and here's where it gets even more interesting. Whatever a person desires or loves, I don't put that in <laughs> they call it good. <clears throat> so, Guinness Extra Stout, I think it's good. I feel desire for it. When I have it in my hand, I have love for it. So I'm drinking it. Uh, Ms. Garnett, uh, the one who had the strongest, uh, most visible reaction against it in the class, she actually feels averse towards it. And if I foist it on her, she hates that. Um, she would say that it's bad, or another term that we often use is evil. Um, we don't usually call beer good or evil, but we call people good and evil, right? And if you just feel contempt towards something, then you call it vile or insignificant. Doesn't matter. All of you have known what it feels like when somebody treats you with contempt, right? They don't even hate you. They don't even care about it at all. That's almost worse, isn't it? Yeah. Is there a reason behind contempt and vile being like seen as negative words? Mm. Um, it's a good question. Do 
You mean like etymologically or? Well, that's just like generally how they're used, but yeah. here they're used for neutral, I guess. Hobbes, you're right. Hobbes is using them for things that we <coughs> don't have feelings about one way or the other. Now, if the way that they affect other people, like if I have contempt for you, Hobbes thinks that you're going to take that as something. <coughs> Because remember that quote, if we all want power, we all want to be valued, and if we don't get it, and, and contempt is the really not getting it. If I hate you, you at least know I can get to him, right? But if I treat you with contempt, then you can really become hostile towards me. As a matter of fact, you, you might say, people hate being treated with contempt. Um, but you're right, the contempt by itself is neither love nor hate. It's, it's, it's a moral reason. Um, so that's a good, good distinction. So we have good, bad, and evil, vile, or insignificant. And Hobbes says, now you can break this down even further. There's different ways in which things are good. Um, remember Aristotle talked about this with the friendship stuff? Um, there's the friends who are good because they're useful. Hobbes says, yeah, some good things. We say that they're good as means. They're useful. Right? Like the, the beer, um, if you're drinking it each day because you think that it's going to improve your health, which it probably isn't going to do. Uh, they say one you know, glass of red wine a day is supposed to be good for you, but I, I don't think beer is, is probably good for you uh, to drink one a day. Um, let's say it was, then it would be useful. The opposite of that is harmful. That's one way things are bad, right? If you drink 12 beers a day, that's probably harmful. Uh, probably harmful in a lot of different ways. It's not good for the end of uh, being in good physical health. It's not good for the end of um, uh, holding down a job. Um, there are some people, I think, who can drink a 12-pack a day and hold down a job, but not many of them. What are other ways things can be good? <coughs> what are other ways we talk about that? Well, remember ple friendships of, of pleasure? There are some good things that are delightful or pleasant. Right? What's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of pleasure? Painful or disturbing. And then you wouldn't guess this right up. And there are things that we call beautiful and things that we call ugly. And Hans says something really interesting about these. He says, that's good or evil in the promise. Why do we think that beautiful things are beautiful? Well, because we think that they're going to bring us pleasure. Uh, why do we think that ugly things are ugly? They are likely to bring us displeasure. This is a, a particular way of looking at good and bad. Um, it, it's a little bit hard to, to get this with some things. That makes sense. Like, think about uh, the attractiveness of people's bodies, right? Or what you find attractive in other people. If you find them attractive, you probably think you'd have a good time with them, one way or another, right? If you find them ugly, you probably think you wouldn't have a good time with them. And we can talk about being ugly on the inside, and ugly on the outside, and beautiful on the inside, and all this sort of stuff. But there's sort of a promise there. I will get pleasure, I will get pain from this person. Um, you can think about that with food, too, right? That's why, if you ever watch, any of you watch those food shows like Iron Chef or um, Top Chef or that? Plating is very important, even though plating doesn't affect the way the food tastes. Why do they care about that silly stuff? If there's, you know, what they call uh, non-functional garnish. Uh, well, because it sort of promises this is going to be a, an enjoyable experience for you. Um, maybe, or it may not, right? Um, somebody just throws a bunch of stuff together on the plate. It might it actually taste good. There are some people who get their, their, their food and they just mix it all together because that's the way they like to eat it. Um, but ugliness is, is sort of a promise that things are going to be bad. Yeah. And now notice, 
these vary. These totally vary according to the person who's feeling them towards the object. So, we use beer as an example. Let's use something else. Um, let's think about music. Um, how many of you... Well, just, just shout. What kind of music do you like to listen to? There's so many different genres, it's hard to pick, pick one. What do you like to listen to? Anyway. Rap. Okay. How many other people in here like rap? Okay. Um, what else? What other kinds of music do people like? Classical. What's that? Classical. How many other people in here like classical? Okay. Notice, not the same people exactly, right? There is some overlap. Um, what are other kinds of music that people like? Okay. R&B. How, how many people like R&B? Okay. Um, what about some that nobody's mentioned, like country? Does anybody like country? Um, what else do we have? Pop, the top 40 stuff, um, metal, who likes metal? Nobody? That's, that's my music. Um, but not, not just any kind of metal, not new metal, 1980s power metal, you know, from the heyday. You know. Um, now notice too, you can break these things down into different genres. There's, when it comes to rap, there's all these different genres. Um, at one time it was East Coast versus West Coast, and then there's Southern rap and all these different, different things. If you go on the Pandora Music Project, you can see all these different uh, types of things. And then, you know, where does rap end and hip hop begin? That's one of those perennial questions, right? And now hip hop can mean anything you like. At least when I was a kid, it meant something fairly specific. And my, my fiance's into hip hop, and she played some stuff for me. I was like, that's not hip hop, that's pop. Said, no, no, we call that hip hop. <coughs> Doesn't mean anything, then. Well, that's kind of a Hobbesian thing. Anything can mean anything to the person. Uh, likewise, with things like good, evil, right, wrong, beautiful, ugly, all these sorts of things are going to vary according to the person who is, who is feeling them. Somebody had their hand up. Uh, classical rock. Oh, yeah. Um, and then it's hard to, does that mean? It's like the 70s, 80s. Yeah, now it's kind of funny because on some stations they'll say, um, for me, classic rock was in the 60s, 70s, and then early 80s, and now they'll play stuff in the 90s and they call that classic rock. But it makes sense because, you know, for, for people who are um, in your generation, that is sort of before your time, and, and uh, it, it has the same sort of function that, say, the Eagles did for me, right? Um, so a lot of these things are very relative. It looks like Hobbes is almost a relativist when it comes to values. Now, you know, maybe that's not a problem. Maybe that's okay. Which is, you know, each, each one of us has our own thing. I think that, that tomatoes are, are you know, the, the, worst, the best thing in the world, and you think that God is the best thing in the world. Yeah, can't we all just get along? You know? Um, I think that we should send more money overseas for foreign aid in, in Africa and you think we should be spending it here at home. Yeah, we just have different opinions. You know, we value things differently. Um, I think that it's okay, that it's actually a lot of fun, it's delightful to torture people. Um, you, don't, you don't get into that. Is there, now we're starting to get into a problem, right? If I have things that I think are good, and you think that they're actually bad, um, what's going to happen to us? What's that? We're, we could argue, yeah. Um, that's not the way it always works. Let's say I want to mug you. We're in, we're in an alley. I'm a pretty big guy. You know, I'm not in good shape, but let's say I have a gun. And, you know, it just came out of a club or something like that, and you're kind of, kind of tipsy and tired. And I put a gun into your belly and I say, give me your money. I'm going to kill you. You could argue with me. You could say, now you see that as a good thing. I see that as a bad thing. Here's why I think it's a bad thing. Would that work? If I'm already being, if I'm already sort of in motion based on my views on what's good or bad or right or wrong, I'm moving, my appetites are moving me. I actually had a friend who did, in fact, 
bargain with a mugger. Um, she was in a bad part of Milwaukee on the beach. <clears throat> and a guy came up to her and he had a knife and he said, give me your money. <clears throat> and she actually, um, like, you know, she didn't have a wallet, but she, she had like a purse or something. And she said, well, I'm going to give you the money in it, but I'm not going to give you the purse because it's got my credit cards and I'm not going to spend the time canceling those credit cards because that's a pain. And I'm not giving you my ID because it takes a long time to get new ID, especially if you don't have ID handy. <clears throat> so I'll give you the money, but the rest of it I'm not going to give you. If you want to you know, do something based on that, um, you can. But I'm just letting you know right up, right up the, you know, you can have the, she had like 80 bucks in her, in her wallet. You can have the 80 bucks. Walk away, uh, or you can, you know, do what you're going to do. Probably, you know, fight me for it. You probably win, but. Um, and the guy took the 80 bucks and went away. That takes a lot of guts. But it was a very smart thing in, in, in some respects. Um, but most people who want what you have, you can't actually bargain with them. They're dead set on it. Or, you know, think about how angry and heated people get about notions of right and wrong. They're willing to fight with each other and kill each other. And if you think that somebody else has a radically different notion of right and wrong than you do, that means they're dangerous to you. You can't trust them. You can't depend on them. You don't know what they would, you know, stop at or, or do next. This is the Hobbesian. This is where we get into stuff like, because um, discussions of power. And now notice, all of the emotions that we have, Hobbes thinks, can be broken down into these basic uh, things, these basic drives. He talks about um, all of these, this is in, in uh, chapter 10, he talks about power, worth, dignity, honor, and worthiness. And he says, the power of a person is their, their means to obtain some future apparent good. And then he talks about all these different modes of power. How do we actually have power? We want to have power, right? Why do we want to have power? Because we want good things. And power is what lets us get good things. You, you may not be used to thinking of things in this way, but what happens when you go into a restaurant? What do you want to do in the restaurant? You go there to dance? go there to watch the game. That might be a secondary thing. What do you go to a restaurant for? Eat. So you have an appetite. Do you want to eat anything? Whatever they put in front of you? <laughs> there probably are a few people, not here in this classroom. There's probably some people that doesn't matter what you put in front of them, they'll eat it, right? Um, you have some particular things that you want to eat. You want it to be delightful. You want it to maybe even be beautiful in a certain sense. Um, who do you get to do that stuff for you? You don't just, you know, like, wave your hands and boom, food's there, right? What has to happen? Restaurants, they divide it into front of the house, back of the house. Who's in the back of the house? The chef. The chef. Is the person in charge, and then there's like a whole army of people underneath, and then you go there, cook that. You know, orders come in. Who takes the orders? In front of the house people, right? Who seats you? A waiter, a hostess, a maitre d', somebody like that. So now you're sitting at the table. Um, you're not going to be happy if somebody doesn't come over and start talking to you pretty soon. Who's that person? Your server, right? And um, how many of you have ever seen a server treated poorly? Only a few of you. Um, it happens every single day. Most establishments, somebody's going to treat the server like a jerk. And quite often, the servers sometimes they treat the cooks like jerks. Um, why do they do that? Well, because when you go into that restaurant, this is power. And the more of this that you have in your wallet, the more stuff you can get done in that restaurant. You can make people do what you want them to do. Satisfy your aims. And we like that. It's a 
Hobbes thinks it's a natural human thing to want to put ourselves above other people. And so when people act like jerks in restaurants, sometimes it's because they can and they want to reinforce um, the, the idea that at least for that moment, they're superior to that waiter or waitress who is um, serving them. Uh, and there are some people who will, you know, send food back to the kitchen just to be jerks about it, just because they can. Um, and this, this sort of stuff goes on. Hobbes thinks that that's actually more common than we would like to think. He thinks that that's sort of the norm, that we want to have power over each other. So what happens when we're friends with each other? We're friends with each other because we like the qualities of other people, but also because we want to get something out of being friends with this person. Friends are power. Think back to high school and cliques. I don't know, you guys have, are there cliques here at, at Marist, like on, with the on-campus students? I don't know. There were at my college. There were, you know, the popular set and the, the jocks and, and all that sort of stuff. It was like high school once again. What's going on with that? That's about power, right? Some people are higher in the social scale, and what keeps them up there? Having power. The ability to dispense benefits to other people. If you want to be popular, throw big parties. Invite a lot of people over. Get them liquored up. Give them nice food. Introduce them to each other. In the business world, how do you have power? You don't get people liquored up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I suppose social social engagements would be yeah, a good example of that. Um, I mean, there, there's other ways. You know, if people are working for you, you have power over them. The more people you have working for you, the more powerful you are. The more accounts you control, the more power you have. The more of an important person you are. And Hobbes thinks deep down inside, we all want power. Um, even people who pretend like they don't want power really do want power. Just want it in different ways. They may pass up being able to tell people what to do, but they want like being looked up to by other people. Hobbes, uh, you know, really in his heart, Hobbes thinks we're, we're mostly a bunch of hypocrites when it comes to this stuff. And what do we, what do we want power in? The sort of things that turn us on. There are some things we don't want people to have power over us. We don't like being pushed down in the lower position. Um, we, we enjoy being on top. We don't like being on the bottom. Except for masochists. Masochists have found some way to resolve this, right? By turning uh, pain into pleasure. And he says, um, you know, what is the value of a human being? This is pretty mercenary. You know, somebody like Thomas Aquinas would say, every human being has value. Why? Because they were created in the image of God. So even if they're a scumbag, there's something good about them. Something, somewhere. Hobbes says, the value or worth of a human being is as, of all other things, their price. That is to say, so much as would be given for the use of their power. That's the only way that you can value human beings in Hobbes' view. And he thinks that we're doing this with each other all the time. Um, so, you know, what, what is my value to you? I can teach you something about ethics. I can be a gatekeeper for this class that you have to take to get, the, you know, get out of Marist College and on with your career. Um, I could be entertaining. I could be boring. Um, do I have any other uses to you? Some of you may end, end up asking me to write your letters and recommendations sometime or something like that. I'll give you a reference. And uh, that would be a use. Any other ways on my, my power is useful to you? That you can think of my hand? You're useful to me, too, right? In an indirect way, you're paying my paycheck. Yeah. I'm not just here out of the sheer joy of teaching philosophy. I do like it. Um, I enjoy actually interacting with students and, and discussing this stuff, so this, this works out good for all of us, doesn't it? But if you look at it in that way, does it look like we're engaged in any sort of noble enterprise? Something that's worthwhile in and of itself? What if I get burnt out? I don't like teaching you guys anymore. That happens to professors. Oftentimes after tenure. Suddenly they don't want to do anything. Um, 
I got burnt out as a student, actually, my senior year. I was totally burnt out. I couldn't wait to get out of school. Uh, I, was, I was so tired of being stuck in classes. I just wanted to get finished and get on with, with something else. That could happen to you, too, right? You could quit feeling all these warm, fuzzy feelings and start feeling little prickly feelings towards learning philosophy. Uh, there's nothing to keep that from happening in Hobbes' view. It's not like philosophy by itself or doing good actions by itself or anything like that would automatically draw you towards the good. Because what's the good? Hey, it varies from time to time and place to place. The good only exists for determinate human beings. So it's the same thing with, with value. And what do we do with people that we value? We honor them. This is another moral concept, right? Honor. And those, this sort of goes to Mr. Cohen's question about uh, contempt. Those who we value low, we dishonor them. And there's all different ways in which we honor people and dishonor them. Like asking somebody's opinion, Hobbes says, is to honor them. It shows that you, you care about what they think. Not asking their opinion when maybe you ought to be asking their opinion, that sends a message, doesn't it? What message does that send? Think about if you've got a friend, really, really close friend. They meet somebody out of the blue and they say, I'm getting married. Would you want them to talk to you about it? Or not? Maybe the way you look at friends is, man, their, their, their stuff is their stuff and I don't want to be bothered with it. Or let's, let's make it a, a different one. Let's say you're married now and your spouse decides that, that it's time to sell the house and buy another house. They didn't, they didn't really ask you about it. Now, they haven't made the sale yet because you actually have to sign on property, um, but they've already talked to the real estate agent, and they've already got all the deals lined up, and they're like, one, one fine morning, you're having some coffee after breakfast on a Saturday, and uh, they come to you with paperwork, and they say, would you mind signing this? Say, What's this? I'm selling the house, and we're going to move in uh, down the street. How would you feel? Valued? You feel dishonored. Hobbes is, is, is talking about precisely these sorts of things. And in society, it becomes very dangerous because it's very easy when you're honoring one person to dishonor others, isn't it? This is, this is what's led to um, the let's give everybody a prize mentality. Because you know, if, we, if we single out one person as being really good at something, then everybody else feels bad, don't they? Someone says a really good trumpet player. We're going to, you know, put him or her on a pedestal. Well, if you do that, then everybody else down here kind of feels like they're they're being dishonored. So what we do is we create a trumpet award and everybody gets a star. Does that work? You guys, some of you have been to schools where that was the norm, I think, right? Well, how do you feel when that happens? Do you feel like everybody's made it up to this level now? Yeah? Well, people need a uh That's true. Um, that often gets left out of the, the sort of decision-making process of that. Because they think, well, you know, they'll all make it up there and then they'll all feel good about themselves. But when you give everybody a prize like that, what happens? Actually, it all drops down to the same level. And now, even succeeding doesn't seem like succeeding anymore. Uh, to paraphrase uh, somebody who got in trouble recently, uh, it's a new kind of winning. Or losing is winning. I think all of you know what I'm talking about, right? So that's that's honor. And then Hobbes actually talks about um, what he calls manners. And um, what he says there is, I'm not talking about stuff like whether you pick your teeth at the table or you know where you put the fork. I mean how we treat each other in society. Um, those qualities of mankind that concern their living together in peace and unity. And he says there is no highest good. There's nothing that we can rely on to appeal to. So how can, we, how can we keep people from fighting with each other? How can we keep people from wanting to 
do each other in, uh, to compete with each other in such ways that, you know, tear society apart. He says, well, we got to look at human nature again. And what do all people want? All people, they, they vary on what they call good, right? So what I think is good may not be the same thing as you. But you want to be able to enjoy the things that you think are good. And you want to be left alone <coughs> just to enjoy it, right? You don't want me coming in and saying, um, okay, that's enough good for you. Uh, now you're done. Or anybody else doing that. I want that too. So if we can appeal to that, that impulse to want to enjoy whatever good it is that, that we have, um, then we might be able to work our way out of this. And this is where he starts talking about this, this restless desire of power after power. If human beings really are that way, then we've got to find some way to sort of curb their natural tendencies, keep them within certain bounds, so they don't um, hurt each other, kill each other, steal from each other, do all these things that we don't want them to do. So what might make us, what motives could we appeal to for that? Can we appeal to our higher motives? You know, it's a noble thing to do. That's not going to work because we don't even agree about what that is. What else can you appeal to? Keeping people in mind. What works? Physical force, yeah. I mean, especially for kids, you know. Um, I know that there are a lot, a lot of things that I didn't do that I was tempted to do because I was afraid of uh, what was going to happen uh, when my dad came home. My mom was, you know, like the, the ordinary disciplinarian, and she was me pretty mean too. You know, those those who uh, like everybody on my street was either spanked or beaten, and if you've been spanked, you know the difference between spanking and beating. Um, there wasn't any of this sort of time out business or anything like that back then. And um, my dad was just much more physically strong. And so if he came home and I was still in trouble, it was going to That works. What, and you can also threaten people with, you know, cutting their hands off or killing them, taking their stuff away, putting them in jail. What are you appealing to in all that? What emotion? Somebody said it. I think I just heard it. Either that or my ears aren't working. Fear. Fear. Somebody who's close to Hobbes in time, Machiavelli, is the one who said it's better to be feared than to be loved. Hobbes thinks the same thing. Because love is not reliable. People change their minds about what they love all the time. But if you tell people, look, if you do this, this is going to happen to you. you. You will still have a few crazy people who do it anyway. Right? But most of them will get in line and not, if, you, if I say, let's say we're a, a society, I say, all right, I'm in charge. None of you steal from each other because if you do, I'm going to cut your hand off. You're probably not going to steal from each other. Especially if you see somebody do it and then their hand gets cut off. Um, and you say, well, we're serious about this now. That's where we're going to leave off, because that's going to lead us into Hobbes' state of nature, and then his solution to this, which is the Leviathan. So what we've looked at so far is, is Hobbes' view of human nature. These are going to feed into each other. So have a good weekend.